In our culture today, we've devalued the word miracle. Like, like think about it. Everything that happens, we say it's a miracle. When the U.S. hockey team beat the 1984 uh, Russian team, L. Michael's famous line was, Do you believe in miracles? Yes. That wasn't a miracle. That was just a hockey game. There is a miracle whip. I understand some of you like mayonnaise, but this is not a miracle, okay? Some of you guys are like, I don't like mayonnaise, so it's not a miracle. I mean, I could eat that by the spoonfuls. I don't know why. I could just like eat it by the spoonful, but it is not a miracle. People talk about Christmas miracles. There's even a movie of Miracle on 34th Street. That's not a miracle. It's just about believing in Santa Claus. You can order Miracle Cream, which claims to take years off your face. I've tried it out, been using it for a little bit. I don't know if you've noticed, but my skin feels a little softer. Wrinkles are gone a little bit. Miracle Grow, there's another miracle. Miracle Grow is supposed to help your plants grow, but that's really just not a miracle. That's just helping your plants grow. Uh, there's a shopping area in Los Angeles called Miracle Mile. The miracle is if you can get out with money left. That would be the miracle, okay? Even great shopping is not a miracle. I'm so thankful that I've never been there because my wife would have to drag me through the streets because I would just, I would, I'd pass out after the first, the first place. I wouldn't even make it the mile. I'd just pass out after the first one because I, I hate shopping. Some of you remember the miracle of, uh, on Markham when Arkansas came back and beat LSU. You guys were like, whoa. Some of you guys lost your minds. Churches were probably packed that Sunday because there was a lot of prayers that were being offered up. And that may have been a miracle. Okay, that may have been a miracle. But none of those are actually miracles. Now, it's fun, something cool or a great product. But guess what? It's not a miracle. The dictionary definition of a miracle is an effect or an extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural powers and is ascribed to a supernatural cause. So in other words, a miracle is something men cannot do. When a miracle happens, your response is, only God could do that. The story we look at today is found in John chapter 11, verse 1. It says this, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. See, this wasn't a common cold or a common headache. Mary and Martha were saying, Jesus, you better get here quick. Lazarus is in deep trouble. Verse 4 goes on, when he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for, the, for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through him. So Jesus was already aware of the situation. Even though he wasn't there, Jesus knew exactly what was happening. So when you're in a difficult situation, you convince yourself that no one could possibly understand. No one has ever faced this all alone. And, and I've realized this, that when, I'm, when, that when I'm not isolating myself, when I'm, when I'm around other people, God places people in my life who can pray for me during a crisis. It's amazing when I'm going through a crisis, God always brings me people who have either dealt with the same thing or is going through the, or, or has already conquered the same thing I'm going through. And I'm like, oh my word. Thank you, Lord, for bringing people in my path who have gone through something similar, who can share the same story, which then brings me hope when I'm feeling desperate. My feelings of hopelessness, it turns into being hopeful. When you isolate yourself from God or even from others, you sit there replaying everything over and over in your mind. The situation gets bigger and bigger in your mind. You start to believe that you are the only one going through this situation. There's 7.88 billion people in the world. You are not the only one that is going through that situation. So you're telling me that 7.88 billion people are going through all something different than what you're going through today. 
That's just a lie from the enemy. But Jesus knew what you're going through. He knows what you're going through. It's not a shock and it's not a surprise to him. In verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and, his sis- and her sister's sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. So he did what? He didn't just immediately go like, okay, someone's sick. Let me go here. Let me, let me do this. Let me, let me heal him quick. No, he stays there for two days. He didn't even know, but now Lazarus, his friends, was in trouble. But Jesus didn't go. Verse 7 says, then after two more days, he says to his disciples, he says, let us go back to Judea. In verse 8 it says, but Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? So when Lazarus was in trouble, But if you go back to Judea, you're going to be killed, and we are going to be killed as well. Let's just hang out here. Let's hang out in the the safety of not being killed, right? It sounds like a good idea. But in verse 9, Jesus answers, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he he sleeps, he will get better. Verse 13, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. You, you know, it's like, it's like you know, your, your wives, you, you say something like to your husband, and, and you're like, hey, we got to do this. And they're like, well, why do we got to do that? Like, because this is what's going on. That's what Jesus says, because he is dead. Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. That statement seems outrageous, doesn't it? But let us go with him. Jesus knew Lazarus was dead. Jesus knew what Mary and Martha was feeling. Nothing was a surprise to Jesus. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, well, let's also go that we may die with him. Thank you, Thomas. Refer to doubting Thomas, but now he's cynical, Thomas, in this moment. I can almost hear it. Okay, guys, if Jesus is so convinced we should go to Judea, let's go get killed. This should be fun. And on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. No doubt this wasn't a doctor's mistake. Lazarus was dead. And if you don't know the end of the story, it appears that Jesus missed this one. He knew what was happening, but something in his divine clock must have been been wrong. After all, Lazarus was dead for four days. I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that, but... It's too late for CPR after four days. You know, like four days, there's no more CPR. Don't go run and get a defibrillator. It's too late, and it's even too late to pray, right? Jesus was late, according to the natural laws of this world. But God does not operate according to the natural laws. Even when you think it's too late, God still has a plan. You know, the doctor says that your disease is is terminal, still not too late for God. With sin and disobedience, you've destroyed your ministry, but God can still use you. It's never too late for God. You've walked away from your relationships and burned your bridges, all the bridges down, but it's still not too late for God. The person you've been witnessing to has shut you down uh, this time for good, but guess what? It's still not too late for God. Your marriage looks over, but it's not too late for God. The creditors are foreclosing. Everything you've worked for is gone, but it's still not too late for God. Your children have turned their back on you and everything that you believe, but it's still not too late for God. You lost everything to addiction, but it's still not too late for God. In verse 18, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them. And in in the loss of their brother, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. See, Martha acknowledged the truth here. See, having faith doesn't mean that you ignore the reality. See, she says, hey, Lazarus is dead. Nothing Martha said was going to change that. 
But in spite of all of that, Martha still recognized the potential for a miracle. Even now, God will give you whatever you ask. So how do you pray that way? You say, God, this relationship is over. It's way over. But guess what? I know. I still believe you can restore my family. God, the doctors say I'm dying. But I still believe for your healing. God, I've, I've, I've messed up again. This time really bad. But I know that you will help me. I can still make it. God, I ha don't have a dime left in my name. My business is gone, but I trust in your provision. God, my children are far from you, but I still believe for their salvation. I refuse to give up. God, I, I don't know how to make it without my next fix, but I believe you will sustain me. We got to acknowledge the truth. Some people say this is negative confession. And it hurts your chances that if you confess your problem, then God won't come to your aid. Well, it's not scriptural. Why? Well, how do I know that? Read Psalms. Just go through the book of Psalms. How many times does David acknowledge a problem that he's having? He says, hey, exalt thee, O God, you are awesome. The world is all against me, yada, yada, yada. But God is faithful. Okay, so he acknowledges the problem. And so we can do that too. We can acknowledge the problem. God is a, attracted to desperate situations, ones that when we never have an answer, there's no hope. Here's a principle. The worse is the worse the truth, the greater the opportunity for God's glory to be revealed. So you may feel like your back's against the wall, but guess what? The truth is the greater the opportunity for God's glory to be revealed. Verse 23 says, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. See, Martha's looking forward to seeing Lazarus in heaven. That's what she is talking about. But Jesus said to her in verse 25, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? See, Jesus offered eternal hope. Not just for Martha, but also for all of us. That whoever lives and believes in me, they will never die. This is the promise that we get. If, if you believe in Jesus, and when it's over in this life, it's still not over. But in this case, Jesus also meant, watch the current situation. Because it's about to change, Martha. Verse 27, Lord, she said, yes, Lord. She told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. She said, the teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. Now, I don't see in this text, as far as we know, Jesus didn't really ask for Mary. Jesus didn't say, hey, go get your sister Mary, bring her over. I'm not sure what Martha was doing. Maybe she was concerned about her sister's faith. Maybe Mary was angry with Jesus. Maybe she's in deep sorrow. The Bible doesn't say that, but regardless of this, Martha knew Mary needed to get to Jesus. Verse 29, when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Mary took off running in the direction of Jesus. She left the place she was supposed to be, mourning the death of her brother to find Jesus. So in your darkest moments, don't go into avoidance mode. Don't stay away from church. Don't stay away from God. Even if it seems like it's too late, but run to Jesus. In verse 30, it says, Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, com 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 comforting her, I don't know why that was such a difficult word today, but today it was, Notice how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her. Suppose she was going to the tomb to mourn her. The whole crowd followed Mary. Isn't that interesting? The whole crowd followed Mary. Even in the darkest moments or, or maybe especially in your dark moments, people are watching you. Mary literally led the crowd to, of mourners to Jesus. And many of their lives were going to be forever changed as a result of that. And when tragedy strikes, you got to be open to the possibility that God can use your difficulty to change the lives of the people around you. In verse 32, it says, When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. And she said, Lord, 
If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary was saying, Lord, Lord, you're too late. But she was also saying, well, you could have kept him from dying. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, Mary was grieving, heartbroken at the loss of her brother. And when Jesus saw that, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. So where have you laid him, he asked. He asked, come and see, Lord, they replied. The next verse is probably the shortest, is the, is the shortest verse in the Bible, packed with a powerful truth. And it's this. In verse 35, Jesus wept. See, Jesus wept at the loss of Lazarus. Jesus knew what was going to happen next, but, but still he cried. Jesus felt pain and sorrow for losing a friend. He felt the sting of grief, loss, and, and death. Jesus' heart hurt for Mary and her pain. And so the powerful truth is, is the theme of this story is even when you feel like no one understands, Jesus understands. Jesus not only knows what you're going through, he knows how it makes you feel. And in verse 36, it says, Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have, say, have kept this man from dying? Instead of mourning and grieving with Mary and Martha, their true negative critical selves came out. So when you're in a difficult spot, here's what you do. You attract two kinds of people. Some is going to cry with you, and some that are going to criticize you. True friends cry with you, okay? True friends cry with you. They share your pain and your hurt. And the critics, they do the opposite. They tell you what, what you should have done. They say things like, well, if you had more faith, if you had more faith, you wouldn't be in this situation. If you really believed in God, he would have helped you. If God really loved you, you wouldn't be in this shape. I thought you were a great Christian. What, what, what happened to you? See, critics wait for a moment of weakness in your life. Critics don't come back and say, I'm sorry, I missed that one. You were right after all. They just wait for the next opportunity to gripe and to complain and to criticize. And so if you're in that situation and you got people criticizing, you can just say, hey, you can criticize somewhere else. But we need fewer critics around us. Jesus completely ignored the critics. There's probably a lesson in that for all of us, but that may be just for another day. In verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. And it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And Jesus says in verse 39, take away the stone, he said. Now think about it. Jesus was in the whole creation process. I don't know if you kind of pick up on this, but... Did the God who created the world really need someone to move a rock for him? I mean, I'm thinking he could have probably been like, okay, stone move, and the stone would have moved itself, and he would have came out. But here's, here's kind of the cool thing, is that Mary and Martha and the onlookers had a chance to be involved in the miracle. See, he gave them their assignment. He says, okay, you mourners, hey, I need two of you guys or four of you guys to remove this stone because Jesus is saying, I'm about to provide a miracle, but guess what? You get to take part in this miracle. Sometimes you put obstacles in the way of God, not literally rocks, but Jesus might say, well, fix your attitude. Get that obstacle out of your way. I want to restore your relationship, but your negative thinking is in the way. I don't know about you, but Friday came and my attitude was bad. And my wife says, Greg, what's wrong with your attitude? I said, I don't know. I need to stop. I need to get out my Bible because I forgot to read it right away in the Bible. And I was reading, okay, Lord, fix my attitude, okay, and now have a better day. Go to church. You've been blaming church for all your problems. Hey, here's the deal. Get over it. Get over it. I got an answer for you. Some of us. Maybe you just got to find a new church. That's okay, dude. Then just find a new one. Quit gossiping. Quit spreading your negative trash to others. Resolve conflict biblically. I'm fascinated with people go, well, let me tell you what I know. I don't care what you know. Get away from me. I don't want to hear the gossip, Okay. Quit trying to do it on your own and admit you need him. The amount, no amount of self-care, mindfulness, or meditation is going to get you out of this 
thing. It's only one person. His name is Jesus. For many of you, you know, financial difficulties. You're like, why am I always short? Your disobedience to God in the area of your finances is the obstacle to your miracle. God would say, quit doing wrong. It's time for you to obey my instructions. Get the obstacles out of the way of your miracle. And for some of you, your situation looks hopeless. It is hopeless without Jesus. Your, hope, your, your obstacle is that you still haven't decided to commit your life to God. So accept Jesus and then remove that obstacle of unbelief in your life. Get rid of the obstacles in your life. What are those obstacles that are in your life right now? But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time, there is a bad odor, for he has been dead, been there for four days. I mean, think about it. I mean, that's, could you imagine, like, what's coming out of that tomb? Jesus is ready to perform an incredible miracle. He gave one simple instruction. He said, remove the stone. Remember Mary, Martha, the one who had all the faith. Now she was not sure about the obedience. Instead, she had an excuse. It might smell bad, Lord. How many of you guys have excuses? I would do what you're telling me to do, Lord, but I need you to do it first. I need you to, to do this miracle, but I'm just not willing to let go and let you do the rest, right? We got to get rid of all the excuses, the obstacles. Give up your excuses, all the reasons you've been willing to act in disobedience to God. Get rid of all of them because it's time for God to do a miracle in your life. I can't afford to obey God in my finances. Well, yes, so give that up. Give that excuse up. It's just not my personality. I get it. Give it up, okay? Some of you men are like, well, I just want to do it my own side. Well, give up the pride right now. Give up the pride because that's, that pride is going to be your fall. So you got to let go. And you may say, well, I don't know what's going to happen. Guess what? I will tell you what will happen. It won't be bad. God has good things planned for you. You don't know what, you've, what they've done to me. I've been hurt. It's not fair. You're right. Life is not fair. But guess what? God is just. It would be difficult to change. I get it. I'm too embarrassed to come forward for prayer. So guess what? Give it up. Don't let excuses keep you from a miracle. Martha says, we can't open the tomb. It's going to smell bad, Jesus. Jesus says, well, thank you, Mary. I, I understand it may smell bad, but I didn't know that for four days, dead bodies smelled bad at all. I thought they smelled like spices and roses and cinnamon. I thought it was smelled pretty. And I'm so glad that you're here. Forget it, right? Keep the tomb closed. We'll just do this differently. I don't know what I was thinking, Jesus probably said, right? No, in verse 40, Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And in today's words, Jesus was saying, do you want to see the glory of God? I thought you believed. Quit with the excuses and just obey me. So in verse 41, so they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you've always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Wouldn't you love to have been there? Man, I get goosebumps right now. I got goosebumps right now. I'm like, whoo. I'm like, yeah. Could you imagine being there? When Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, you know, you know like, then you're like, what's about to happen? You know, you're like, like you're not just standing there like this. Oh, it's going to see a nice little miracle. Man, I'll be like, I'll be like, whoo, what's about to happen? Is Lazarus really going to come out? But it makes me laugh. What else would Jesus say at that moment? Do you think the moment Jesus woke up, he headed to the entrance of the tomb? Was Lazarus waiting for an invitation? Well, I don't think so. I think Jesus said, come out for the benefit of, of the gathered crowd. Jesus had to know Lazarus was already on his way out. Verse 44 says, the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with the strips of linen and cloth that are around his face. And I wish the Bible gave more details about what happened afterwards. Like, what happened to the crowd? Lazarus was walking out of the grave, and I don't think the, 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 the crowd's like, oh, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I thank you. I thank you. Some of you guys are like, well, I don't, I don't, right? No. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. No, I think it was crazy. I think, I think people were, were running around, spinning around. I think, I think they were less concerned about what was happening. And they're going, oh, my goodness, this thing is nuts. This thing is crazy. I can't believe this. Did you just see that? I, you know, like, could you, I would be like, send someone. Did you just see that? And my wife would be like, Greg, stop hitting me. She, I mean, like, you would be going crazy. Because we just saw a dead man walk out. It'd be like going to a funeral. And all of a sudden, Jesus coming in and be like, arise. And the, the, the dead guy comes out. I mean, everyone would be like, oh. Like, they'd be running around that place, hugging him, being excited. And poor Lazarus couldn't get out of the grave clothes. He was all wrapped up. Everyone was so excited. They forgot to unwrap the dead man. They were like, they're so excited. Like, I can't believe it. Did you see that? And he's over here like, help me. I can't see. I smell bad. I need a shower. And like, start taking them off, taking off the strips of linen. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did. And they put their faith in him. Isn't verse 45 amazing? Many of the Jews, many of the Jews who had come and seen put their faith in them. It didn't say all of the Jews, though. There are there many more than many. It says many of the Jews. How do you not put your faith in Jesus after that? How do, you, how do you go like, I think it was a magic trick, you know, like how? See, unbelief doesn't just happen here, it happened in the Bible times too. Jesus went to a funeral, he turned it into a celebration. All the mourners, they gathered there to weep and wail, but Jesus had something else in mind. What does this story mean for you? It's this one word. Jesus can bring life where there has been death. With one word, Jesus changes everything. With one word, what you discover that it, what it looks like is over. You're like, it's all over. But Jesus says, but guess what? I have come on the sea. Your opinion of when it is over, too far gone, is not necessarily right. That's his call. It's not yours. And Paul says in Romans 4, 4 17, he says, the God who gives life to the dead. And calls things that are not as though they were. Maybe everyone is telling you it's done. Maybe the mourners have gathered around you. And around your financial situation. Your marital situation. Your business. Your ministry. Whatever it is in your life this week. And they said, it's done. You may want to do something else. Or let's try this. We can do something different. My question for you is, what looks dead in your life? What looks dead in your life? Because, hold on a minute, it's not dead. Because Jesus gets the final answer. What looks over in your life? What is important to you that it looks dead? It doesn't have to be like, like you're like, oh, this. It could be like just something maybe that's important to you and it looks over. What looks hopeless? What looks too far gone? It's not too far gone for Jesus. He knows where you are and what you need, and he has the answer. So this morning, this is what we're going to do. We're going to end our time in prayer as our, as our praise team comes and to worship and lead us in worship. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. And, and here's what I want you to do. If you have a situation in your life where you're like, I just need Jesus. I need Jesus' word. I want you, you're going to come and you're going to pray. And I know some of you guys are going like this. Well, I don't know if I do that. I want Jesus just to do my miracle in my seat. But guess what? There's a time where you got to participate in the miracle. Okay, you got to participate in the miracle. So your participation is you getting your butt off the seat and coming up for prayer. And you may say, well, what, is, what are people going to think about me? Who cares what they think about you? You need a word from the Lord. You need Jesus to give you, whether clear direction, whether it be something over your business, your, your, mar your marriage, your, your just financial picture, job status, whatever it is. You need a miracle. And we're not rolling away stones today. But we just got to get up and come forward. So this morning, if our prayer team will come, we want to pray with you. And so as they lead worship, here's what I want you to do. I want you just to stand up right now. Just stand up. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. 
I'm going to pray for you. And then after I'm done, if you need, if you need God to speak a word over a situation, I want you to come up right after I get done praying. Don't wait. Don't talk yourself out of it. Don't say, well, if the pastor says this one word. No, just come. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you do. Lord, I pray, Lord, for the needs that we're going to pray for, Lord, today. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you just move the only way you can move. Just like in Lazarus' situation, it was one word. It was one phrase. It was one encounter with you. You said, Lazarus, come out. And he came out, Lord. Today, we need a word from you, Lord. There are people here that are that have gone through some things. They just need an encounter with you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you just meet their need and you give them the word that they need for today. In your name I pray.